Well, I'm delighted to be here. I thank Rosemary and the, the Bridgeville Historical Society for inviting me. Um, and uh, we'll get right to it. And so first of all, and by the way, at the end, uh, I'll be delighted to stay around. We'll take questions. And it's good to see uh, the, uh, are they high school students back there? Yes. How many do we have? Well, that's great. That's great. Well, anyway, as you can see from the uh, first slide here, the title of my talk is Hollywood, World War II, and the Movies. Prior to World War II, as you can imagine, movies were a giant business in the United States, much, much larger than it is today. And you can see here that population in 1940 of the United States was about 131 million. Today it's about 330 million. So we've grown a little bit in the past uh, 70 plus years. But look at this, the next point down. In 1940, approximately 85 million people bought tickets every week. Now think about this. You get a population of 130 million. You exclude babies and children and older people that can't get to the movies. What you really have is you have about two out of every three people in the United States at this time going to the movies weekly. Weekly. Movies, as we're going to see, was a big business prior to World War II. The box office in 1946, go back to the one. The box office in 1946 had risen to 95 million. Hollywood today would be absolutely astounded and thrilled if they had that many admissions a week. The number of admissions they have today are in the low single digits in a sense millions a week. And so the other thing though it's down at the bottom is women made up the majority prior to World War II, women made up the majority of moviegoers and in the United States this time there were 16,500 movie theaters. Today nowhere near that number. So America went to the movies. There was no television, Radio was out there, but this was the real form of entertainment for the American public, the movies. There were about 30,000, it was a big business, there were about 30,000 people making movies in Hollywood. And it's not actors and actresses. These are everything from the sound people, the lighting people, the carpenters, electricians, the women who sewed the costumes, the people that made the sets and design extremely skilled, but there are about 30,000 employed out there, and you can see across the United States, there were about 250,000 people employed in the movie industry. That included the ushers and people in the, uh, you know, the various movie theaters that uh, projected the movies. And what you see it during World War II, and it's going to have an impact, the number of movies that Hollywood actually makes per year during World War II is actually going to decline. We'll talk about why that is from what they were making in the 1930s. And it's important, you say, why do I put this stat up there? Two billion feet of film that they used every year. This wasn't digital. These were analog films. And the important thing is one of the basic components, chemical components of film is cellulose, Cellulose is also one of the basic components of gunpowder. So the government is going to ask Hollywood to reduce the number of feet that they're going to use, which is also going to have an impact on the number of movies that they make. There were six major studios out in Hollywood, and they were in Hollywood at the time. Almost all the films were shot on sound stages in Hollywood. They were not shot uh, on location, especially during World War II. 
And so here we see, they're pretty familiar to those that are movie buffs, Warner Brothers, 20th Century Fox, Universal, go ahead, Judy. Columbia RKO, which was owned by the Kennedy family. John Kennedy's father was a big investor in RKO and Paramount Pictures. Here's a picture of the back lots. They were very, very large. They covered many, many acres in Hollywood. All of the back lots just about are gone today. They've been sold off for various shopping centers and other development. So 1930 run, 39 comes around. And you probably know World War One, at least, or World War II rather, is considered to have begun with the invasion of Poland by Germany on September 1st, 1939. Several days later, the British and the French declare war on Germany. The United States is still at peace. We have not formally declared war on anybody. But one of the things is that Hollywood has that many of the studios are owned by Jewish people, and especially Warner Brothers. And already, of course, uh, the Jews had been ejected or put in concentration camps. They weren't put in the death camps yet throughout Germany. So many of them, as we're going to see, flee to the United States. And the Warner Brothers is the first, the five Warner Brothers, are the first to make movies. And their goal is to educate the public about the evils of Adolf Hitler and Nazism and the evil of Japanese militarism. Go ahead. The first World War II movie that's made before World War II is called Confessions of a Nazi Spy. And it stars down in the lower right Edward G. Robinson. Now the movie is, came out in 1939. It does okay at the box office, but it's not a big success. But the goal of the movie, again, was to educate the public as to the evils of Nazism. Of course, then we know on December 7th, 1941, the Japanese attacked us at Pearl Harbor. The following day on December 8th, Franklin Delano Roosevelt <laughs> addresses Congress and asks for a declaration of war against Japan. Against Japan. And it's granted. Only one member of Congress, a woman from Montana, Janet Rankin, votes against the declaring war on Japan. <laughs> she is eventually, in 1942, defeated when she runs again for Congress. In December 11th, after the Germans, who for some, we could go into the reason, that's a whole other top, topic, declare war on the United States, on December 11th, we declare war on Germany. From the very beginning, the United States government is going to be involved in movies. Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the president of the time, is a movie buff. His daily routine, as you know, that he was very much handicapped. For him to stand was extremely painful. He had contracted polio in the 20s, basically was paralyzed from the waist down, which was hidden from the American public. But when he was president, what he used to do is, is that during the evening after he had uh, spent the day doing presidential duties, uh, he would have dinner. The White House food was absolutely terrible because Eleanor wasn't there and wasn't a very good cook to begin with. She specialized in hot dogs. <laughs> I told you about her culinary skills. And so, um, but after dinner, Franklin Delano Roosevelt would like to have a drink or two and then watch movies. Now in those days to watch a movie, they had to bring in a movie projector, you know, and it had film on a spool and they showed it. So, but he generally, if he was able to, watch the movie every day. So he was not only a movie buff, he understood the impact that movies could have on the American public. So one of the things that they did very early on is, of course, in those days, there was an expanding bureaucracy in government. They created the Bureau of Motion Pictures. 
and he appointed several people to uh, head it up. It was in Los Angeles. It was very large, eventually had over a thousand employees, and they got a little bold. They didn't censor movies, but they suggested themes, and eventually one of the men decided he was going to write some dialogue, and at that point Hollywood had enough of them and used political influence, and their political influence on over Hollywood waned from that point. Prior to World War II, as you know, there were Hollywood themselves instituted what's called the Production Code. The Production Code was because movies were becoming rather risque in the early 30s. And so things like you could not show, or the theme of the movie could not be a extramarital affair. The man and woman had to be married. No swearing. The good guys won. Crime would not pay. They had some very strict Hollywood did enforcement of this. The production code movies. And it's going to have an impact on the movies that are going to be made during Hollywood. During, this, during the early, during the World War II. And then we're going to see that Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who had been Assistant Secretary of the Navy during World War I under Woodrow Wilson, did not want what he called Hate the Hun movies made. He did not want movies that basically, uh, Hate the Hun basically say hate the Germans, because there were a lot of people of German heritage in the United States, and it backfired in World War I. And also that spilled over into movies about don't hate the Japanese. You can hate the policy, you can hate the leaders, but don't hate the ethnic group. And finally, George Marshall. George Marshall, of course, was the head of the United States Army, born in Uniontown, Pennsylvania, attended VMI, was not a West Point graduate. And George Marshall, after the war, says that along with radar, code breaking, movies helped win the war. And we're going to see why he said that. They, so he, both the, the head of the armed services, the Army of the United States, and FDR, frankly believed that movies could have a major role in helping the United States win World War II. Now, one of the things that happened is, when the war broke out, these five directors, who were frankly probably the best directors in Hollywood, all left Hollywood to enlist either in the Army, Army Air Corps, or the Navy. Now, they, during the war, they are going to make movies, but not commercial movies. They are going to make movies, as we're going to see, to influence the public, to educate the public about the war. First one is John Huston. Now, prior to World War II, John Huston had written and directed an outstanding movie, The Maltese Fault. During the war, John Huston, who was going to be in the Army, the first movie he's going to make is Report from the Illusions. You may or may not remember that the Japanese actually invaded Alaska, the islands of Alaska. And we sent US troops up there and Navy people to eject them. And John Huston went up there to make a movie about that, which is called Report from the Illusions. All of these movies I'm going to talk about for the young people in the back, they're all on YouTube. <laughs> so you want to see them, you know, all you have to do is bring up YouTube. And then at the end of the war, or then he made later on in the war, San Pietro, which is about the fighting in Italy, where the United States Army suffered over 100,000 casualties in Italy, including Bob Dole, who, uh, that's why you see Bob Dole, who's still alive today, was a captain there, severely wounded. You can see why his arm, his one arm is useless. And so he made a movie about the fighting in Italy. And then finally, at the very end of the war, as Rosemary said, they began to tackle other subjects. And one of them was what we call today, then they called battle fatigue. Today we call post-stress traumatic syndrome. He was addressing men who were blinded, and how the war and what was happening to these people and how they were recovering. This movie was not put out after it was made. It was shelved for 30 years. So the government said, no, nah, we don't think we want to 
I'm going to put this out here. Can I have you? George Stevens. Now, after the war, of course, uh, John Houston directs the treasure of the Sierra Madre and, and some other movies. George Stevens uh, was one of the great directors of comedies prior to World War II. Some of his comedies you see on TCM, they're really hilarious and funny. But George Stevens goes in the army and goes ashore with the American army basically at D-Day and stays with the American army to the very end. George is one of the guys who filmed the concentration camps, as you see down in the lower right. He created, films a lot of it, the, uh, the concentration camps. That footage, George comes back and puts into a, these movies, by the way, these gentlemen made, are fairly brief, 15 minutes to a half hour. He makes a movie about the concentration camps the footage he puts away in a warehouse, never to see it again. Doesn't destroy it, it is known until it is used again by Steven Spielberg for Schindler's List. Okay. William Wyler. We're going to see Wyler is going to direct a movie in 1942, which is going to win the Best Picture Award, but he goes again to the Air Force and creates a movie called The Memphis Bell. Now this isn't the commercial movie that came out, you know, years ago, about two decades ago. This is an army movie about the crew, the actual crew, The Memphis Bell. And then also he flies and creates a movie about the Thunderbolt. In doing so, William Wyler loses his hearing. Imagine this, your successful Hollywood director and the noise from the airplane engines cause you to lose your hearing. Eventually he recovers partial hearing, but William Wyler is among several of the directors who actually put their lives on the line. Go ahead. <coughs> Frank Capra, probably the most su successful director in a sense prior to World War II. He directs a number of excellent movies, including Mr. Smith Goes to Washington and others. Uh, Frank makes a whole series of movies, which are on YouTube, about basically why we're fighting to the American public. And it's shown commercially in the theaters, but the goal is to explain to the American public why we're really fighting World War II. The first of these is Prelude to War, and then later on he makes a whole series, one of which is the Battle of Russia. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Okay, here too. John Ford goes into the Navy. He makes two movies, one at Pearl Harbor, which he's not at, but using the footage that was shot. The second one is at Midway in June of 1942, when the Japanese attack on Midway, the island. Uh, off the island, of course, the American Navy is winning the Battle of the Carriers, which is basically going to tip the balance of World War II. And from then on, after that early June defeat by the Japanese carriers, where we sink four carriers, that the Americans are going to control the Pacific Ocean. In filming this, John Ford is wounded. So he obtains a Purple Heart. Go ahead. So, from 1941, when the Americans entered the war, until 1943, the objective of the Hollywood movies is to build morale. Pump up the American public. Because the outcome of the war is uncertain. We know who won the war, but in 1942 and 1943, it wasn't clear as to whether the Allies were really going to prevail. Go ahead. So in 1942, this movie comes out. Mrs. Miniver. It's a story of an upper-class British family who are, suffer, unfortunately, a tragedy in this movie for those of you who've seen it, where the son, they have a son who goes into the RAF. The son is not killed. His fiance is killed at the end of the movie by bombing. It's an outstanding movie, and Walter Pidgeon and Greer Gar uh, Garson are the stars of the movie, and as you can see, it won Best Picture. It is extremely popular at the box office. 
But there's a whole series of movies that now begin to come out in 1942. The first is Wake Island, which depicts the American defeat at Wake Island. And you can see some of the, uh, there the posters and stars Brian Donlevy and William Bendix. Uh, they don't know the full story, but the movie again, this was the first actual, you might say, combat World War II movie. It is extremely successful at the box office. Mm -hmm. But then 1943, they're still trying to educate the public about the evils of Nazism. This movie was just recently shown on TCM, Hitler's Children. And basically what it's trying to portray is how evil the Nazis are to children. Go ahead, Judy. The most popular movie in 1943 is this movie. It's a musical. This is The Army, written by Irving Berlin. One of the stars in this movie is who? Ronald Reagan, future president of the United States. You see him down there in the lower left, okay? It's a good movie, and the public liked it, and this is the number one box office movie in 1942, 1943. This is based on, loosely on, a real event, Air Force. What it is is about the flight of B-17s that fly into Pearl Harbor on the morning of December 7th, and then later on they fly on to the Philippines. The interesting thing is who's in the cast of characters. You see in the upper right, the man who is looking over Gig Young's shoulder. Where did he go to college? What? Nobody knows? Carnegie Tech. Arthur Kennedy. Carnegie Tech graduate. And so this movie is extremely popular, and again, it's one of the first movies that portray the Air Force. Now they're beginning to base movies on real events. The 1943 Air Force is loosely based on, this is based on a real event about nurses who were trapped in the Philippines. It's a good movie. So proudly we hail. This is the movie where the Bureau of Motion Pictures tries to insert dialogue and Hollywood says, get out of here. We know how to make movies and how to write dialogue. And so this is the movie where Veronica Lake, who is up in the upper right, is killed in the movie. It's a very popular movie uh, and it's well acted. Yeah, yeah. Guadalcanal Diary, which is based on a diary that was kept by a newspaper reporter who was at Guadalcanal. One of the things, the problems that Hollywood had was all of the basically actors between the ages of 18 and 25 or 30 were scoffed up by the army or enlisted themselves, so they had to use people like Richard Jackal down in the lower right, who's 15 years old during this movie. The Scan is a very, very popular movie. <clears throat> this is George Stevens. This is a funny movie. You've never seen it. Get it and watch it. It's extremely funny. It also has one of the most sexiest scenes ever filmed in the movie. And this is with a production code. The production code. So with the production code, the, the enforces is it leaves a lot to the imagination of the viewer. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, you. In 1943, this movie is made, Gung Ho, which portrays the raider, marine raiders who invade Macon Island. Now, Franklin Delano Roosevelt's sons serve in World War II and serve in very dangerous places. One of his sons is actually one of the raiders. Now, Hollywood is not dumb. When this movie is finished, they take it to the White House to show it. <clears throat> At the end of the movie, and you may or may not, depending on what version you get, one of the people they portray or show at the end of the movie is FDR's son, James, who is one of the Raiders. Eleanor, seeing her son, says, this is a movie all mothers should see. 
So they, you know, use the Roosevelts to, to uh, hike the box office. Go ahead. And there again, you're seeing the evils of the Japanese. On this side, you can see up there, not suitable for the general public. But it's not at the time, and even today. Go ahead. The next thing that happens is the war, of course, was a war of the United Nations. America did not win the war alone. In fact, you know, if you say that there's somewhere between 35 and 50 million people killed in World War II, the United States suffered 450,000 casualties. Most of the fighting was done by other nations, especially the Russians and the Chinese. And so movies began to uh, portray the Allies. This movie is unfortunately an unfortunate movie this movie, because it's a lie. Mission to Moscow, made in 1943, based on a book written by the ambassador to the Soviet Union in the late 1930s. And what it portrays is, is the communists are nice people, just like people living in Kansas City. Well, fortunately, most of the American public know that was garbage, because the Russians, as you know, the Stalin under Stalin, may have killed prior to World War II more people than Hitler killed in their own citizens. They at least killed two million Ukrainians. So this movie is to show the Russians being allies and great people, which they weren't. They were allies, but they weren't great people. The interesting thing is about Davies is Davies marries a wealthy heiress and ends up stalking his art collection with art that the communist had stolen. Tells you a little bit about the guy himself. But in 1943, this movie comes out, Sahara. It's about a lone tank in the desert in North Africa. The crew is basically a composite of the United Nations. And so here again, the movies are now trying to portray the American public there is more people fighting in this war than just Americans. And then in 1944, we have Passions de Marseille, starring Humphrey Bogart, which again shows the French involvement in World War II, even though the French, as you know, had surrendered basically in June of 1940 to the Germans. The French do have troops eventually and ships and air crews that are fighting on the Allied side. So in 1943 to 45, or 44 to 45, the war is now being won. There's a sense in the country that the war is going to conclude with an Allied victory. So what we're beginning to see is Hollywood portray movies based on real events. Also, one of the things that's happening right now is the advent of newsreels that came out. Even though they are not real time, they are showing the real war in a sense. And as you can see here, over a thousand newsreels are made during World War II. There are special theaters, I wouldn't to say built, but showing nothing but newsreels like at, uh, opposite, for instance, Grand Central Station or big, big city train stations where people are waiting for trains. They can go in and see a 10 or 15 minute newsreel one after the other. Well, the impact on Hollywood of this is that war movies themselves, starting around 1944, are box office toxic. People don't want to see the war. They want to laugh and sing. And you're beginning to see movies to portray the impact of the war on the home front. This is one of the movies that comes out, Since You Went Away. It's a terrific movie about the impact on this family, that the husband is away at war, and what the uncertainty as to whether he's going to survive the war. And I won't spoil it for you. If you haven't seen it, go ahead and view it. 
Now we have real things. We have this bombing raid, the famous Doodle raid conducted in 1942. This comes out based on a book by this man who's portrayed by Van Johnson, Ted Lawson. And part of it is, is the help that these air crews got from the Chinese at great risk. Now one of the little known stories of World War II to rescue these pilots who bombed Japan and then were gonna fly over to China and land and be rescued, estimated that maybe as many as a quarter million Chinese perished, were slaughtered by the Japanese in trying to find these pilots. In 1945, we, the war has expanded. We have Objective Burma, starring Earl Flynn. So geographically, the war is also expanding. And now it begins to address serious issues, in a sense, about what happens to men. This is a true story about a Marine who was blinded on Guadalcanal and his struggles to reintegrate himself back into society. This is Dwight Eisenhower's favorite World War II movie, G.I. Joe. Robert Mitchum is actually portraying a real American captain who is killed in combat, and it is shown in the movie. And so this, again, they're beginning to show movies or, or uh, create movies based on uh, real events. In 1946, we have another best picture, and that is Best Years of Our Lives, that talks and addresses the issue of how people, these soldiers coming back, how they're going to be able to reintegrate into American civilian society. 1948, between 19, you notice what's happening here. There's really, between 1945 and 1948, there's really no combat movies that we would think of as World War II movies. And in fact, in 46, 47, and, and going into 48, they're really not making movies about, 19, about combat in World War II. But with the advent of this movie, Sands of Iwo Jima starring John Wayne, and three of the flag raisers, who's shown in the movie here raising the flag, are survivors of that. The rest that get killed on Iwo Jima never getting off. Movies are immensely popular, and this begins to, we're going to see for almost the next two decades, is going to spawn a whole series of World War II movies. Okay. 1949, we have 12 O'Clock High, starring Gregory Peck about the stress upon senior commanders in this great bombing campaign that was being conducted from England over Germany. And go ahead. Then in 1949, we have Battleground. One of the stars of this movie, John Hodiak, as you see there reading the paper, behind Van Johnson in the center, is from Aliquippa, former steel worker. 1953, we have, based on a best-selling novel, From Here to Eternity, so now all of a sudden you're seeing a number of these pictures that are starting to come out these are all excellent. The ones I'm showing up here are well worth watching. These are extremely well made, well acted, and they're sort of at the heyday of the Hollywood studio system where still a lot of the lighting and technical people were still in Hollywood. Okay. Stall Act 17, which portrays a prisoner of war camp, which William Holden escapes from. And then we have 1954, the Kane Mutiny, which again now focuses on the stress upon senior commanders, in this case, the ship captain, Herman Woke, who wrote this, is still alive at the age of 103. And he served, by the way, in the US Navy in World War II. 1955, now you're beginning to see movies that are sort of taking a semi-lighthearted approach but are beginning to film the backwater of the movie. If you know, there were 16 million American men and women that served in World War II. Only about two million actually saw the elephant, that is, shot it. The vast majority of people 
roughly 10 million plus or minus. <clears throat> We're nowhere near a combat zone. And so this movie portrays the boredom of World War II. And we have a biopic about Audrey Murphy in 1955 about his exploits, the most highly decorated soldier in World War II. And actually this film underplays what he actually did. He did a lot more than what the movie shows. Then we have another best picture, 1959, Red Drum River Kwai, about British POWs that are, that are used as slave labor to build a railway in Southeast Asia. And it's a true story. Many of them did perish. And this is a movie about that event. 1961, now we're getting off into sort of the adventure style of movies. Not quite based on real fact anymore. This movie, 1961, Guns of Navarone, and the next movie, 1962, is The Longest Day, which is based on a best-selling book by Cornelius Ryan about D-Day. And what I want you to keep in mind, I'll show you, is how Hollywood portrays D-Day, one of the stills on the lower right. Okay. 1963, we have The Great Escape, starring Steve McQueen and James Garner. James Garner did not fight in World War II, he fought in Korea where he was wounded. And so uh, we see this film, which again portrays American and British POWs. 1965, Harm's Way, again based on a best-selling book that really talks about the United States Navy entry into World War II in the South Pacific in 1942. But then the Vietnam War starts getting okay? And I don't know if you could, you might not be able to see this real well, but basically you could break down how Hollywood treats World War II in the various time periods. So we saw here from 1939 to 1945, there was a whole series of movies to educate the public about the evils of Nazism and the Japanese. 1942 to 1944 was a series of movies to build morale. 1943 to 1945 again emphasizes the fighting of the United Nations. 1944 to 1945, <coughs> actual combat movies are becoming a drag on the box office, and you don't see a reemergence of those until Battleground and others. From 1949 to 1965, World War II movies are extremely popular, though, as we know, Hollywood. Attendance is declining rapidly because of that little box, television. And movie theaters are closing up left and right. So from 1966 to 1993, there basically is very, very few war movies made about, you know, when I say war movies, World War II themed war movies. It's the anti-Vietnam War period. So we're looking at almost two decades where very, very few movies are made, okay? with some exceptions. In 1970, an outstanding movie, Tora, 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 which documents, with some pretty good historical accuracy, the events leading up to the attack on Pearl mm -hmm. Harbor and the attack itself. Mm -hmm. Then in 1970, we have another World War II movie win Best Picture, Pat, starring George C. Scott. And so from 1993 till today, you've had a big resurgence in World War II themed movies. They are successful at the box office. They show realistic combat, and we're going to see that. And the emphasis on historical events, and the emphasis on heroes. 1993, we have Schindler's List, which of course is about Schindler, a Swede, who uh, using his influence is able to save well over a thousand people from the Nazi death camps. In 1998, this is when it really though blossoms. This movie did not win the Academy Award for Best Picture, but Saving Private Ryan is very, very uh, well received and it realistically 
depicts the activities uh, for these men to a large extent, especially on Omaha Beach in the morning. So go ahead. Now look at this. The difference is to how Hollywood portrayed 1962, The Longest Day, with Jeffrey Hunter. And look at the same vignette portrayed in 1998. The impact of this movie is tremendous because people begin to realize just how horrific combat is. It's no longer sanitized. And what these young men, and they are young men, most of them between the ages of 18 and 25, what they do under these absolutely appalling conditions. And we move ahead from 98 to what's happening in the last few years. 2014, The Imitation Game. Hollywood now begins to, this is a British film, Hollywood now begins to address themes that were secret. The code breaking, which was absolutely essential to winning World War II, which was not revealed until the 1970s. And this is a movie about Alan Turing, the guy who basically invents the programmable computer. And he invents it and helps track German U-boats. And while we don't remember, over 50,000 merchant and allied sailors died in the Battle of the Atlantic. That is, ships that were going from basically the North American coast to England to keep England supplied. And so this became, uh, the code breaking became absolutely essential to victory. And this is, this is an outstanding movie. Go ahead, Judy. In 2016, we see this movie, Hacksaw Ridge. Based on, he portrays a real man. The only, the first conscientious objector to be awarded the Medal of Honor at Okinawa in April of 1945. Desmond Doss. And what you see here, just imagine this. It's American troops actually climbing cargo ladders, cargo nets, to get to the top of Hacksaw Ridge. The movie is very violent, and it has to be to show exactly what Doss is as a medic, rescuing tens of Americans in this absolutely horrific uh, carnage that was going on on the top of Hacksaw Ridge. And it just shows Doss, which is true, he was advancing into the flames, not running away. 2017, we have this movie, Dunkirk, another British movie, based on the true story of the evacuation of 400,000, roughly 400,000, attempted evacuation of 400,000 British and French soldiers from the beaches and the harbor at Dunkirk. It stole visually. The characters in there are never identified, and most of them are fictional composites. But it is a remarkable movie and gives you an impact as to how difficult and how dangerous it was for these men on the beach and how difficult it was for them to get back to England. And now we have this movie out that may or may not win Best Picture for 2017, The Darkest Hour which portrays the five days at the end of June, or end of May, rather, of 1940, when there's a lot of pressure on this man, Winston Churchill, to come to terms with Hitler. If you haven't seen this movie, I would say this. Go see it, but before you see it, do a little bit of reading. It assumes an adult audience in the sense that you have some knowledge about what had occurred up to the time that Churchill becomes prime minister in May of 10th of 1940, and then what these five days are about. It is remarkably well acted, and it's really a truly <coughs> amazing movie. Go ahead, Judy. Ah, question. Getting to the end. What World War II film has been shown most often on television? Not even close. Yes? Casablanca. Casablanca. 
So we don't have to have it. It's rated number two by the American Film Institute of the greatest movies made at all time. I think it's number one, because I don't like Citizen Kane. So, and then the film was awarded Best Picture at Oscar in 1943. Go ahead, Julie. How many have seen this movie? Raise your hands. The young people in the back haven't seen it? You gotta watch the movie. Next time you saw it, you Okay. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's interesting for a couple of points. There's no combat in this movie. The Germans really are never in Casablanca, they are in the movie. And there's no such things as exit visas. But it's a great movie. And you see on here that the cast includes, we're going to see more of them, Humphrey Bogart, Ingrid Bergman, Sydney Greenstreet, but go ahead, Judy. The interesting thing about this movie, only three Americans, basically, appear in the movie. Humphrey Bogart, the piano player, Dooley Wilson, who can't play the piano, he's a drummer, he sings the songs, but he can't play the piano. And Warner's stepdaughter, Joy Page. When you see this group in this the cafe, remember I said that actors and actresses were fleeing Germany, Austria, and elsewhere? About 1,500 end up in Hollywood. Many of them portray experts, or extras in this movie. And what we see down here is, uh, you see at the top, Sidney Greenstreet was a British actor. But at the bottom, we have Madeleine Lebeau and Leonard Kanitsky from St. Petersburg, Russia, Bogart's drinking buddy. Madeleine is the last member of the cast to die. She died in 2016. So when they sing the Marseille, and the people are singing it, and trier, uh, tears are streaming down their faces. It's real tears, because these people were kicked out of Europe. Now this movie is made in the summer of 1942, okay. when the outcome of the war is still very much uncertain. It's really amazing how this movie was written. The original was a play that was never put on Broadway called Everybody Comes to Ricks, written by a older lady and her, and a guy, they weren't, they weren't involved. The interesting thing about this is that the way the movies were made then, Scripts came pouring in, or suggestions for movies came pouring in to Hollywood. They landed on the desk, typically of what were called one of the lowest paid employees. Their job was to screen these scripts to decide whether any of them had any potential for a movie. This script on December 8th, 1941, the day after Pearl Harbor, lands on the desk of the lady at Warner Brothers, whose job it is to screen scripts. She reads it, sends a memo. The one great thing about Warner Brothers, just like Churchill, Warner Brothers insisted that everything be put in writing. So we have a lot of information about how this and other Warner Brothers movies were made. And so, she sends up and says, this has tremendous potential. And Warner Brothers pays $20,000 for this script that has never been shown, never been produced on Broadway, the highest amount ever paid for a play that had never been done on Broadway. They then turn it over to a whole galaxy of writers. And I don't want to go through all the machinations, but the interesting thing about this, these are some of the best writers that have ever written movies for Hollywood. 
They include the Epstein brothers who graduated from their outstanding movie producing university, Penn State. They were boxers at Penn State. They end up in Hollywood being screenwriters. Also a man named Howard Koch. And one of the things, because the production code will not allow the movie to end with Rick going off with a married woman, how's the movie has to end? Go on, Judy. And I'll, we'll talk about that. One of the things is Claude Rains and Conrad Veet. <coughs> Claude Rains is one of four actors who serve, they're British actors, who serve in World War I in the same regiment, which is about 700 men. <coughs> Rains is gassed. Herbert Marshall and Ronald Coleman are both seriously wounded. If you ever watch Ronald Coleman, he walks with a limp. Marshall lost part of his leg. And only Sherlock Holmes escapes injury, Basil Rathbone. But Rains, who has a farm in Pennsylvania, loves his farm and comes to Hollywood as infrequently as he can to start in movies. Conrad Veet was one of the leading actors in Austria, and he's one that flee. And yet now he is, he's fleeing the Nazi. What is he playing? A Nazi. We know the movie ends at the airport with Major Strasser, who's another actor who has fled Germany portraying a Nazi, being shot. And one of the things is, of course, the dialogue in this movie has some great lines. In the 50s, 60s, through the 70s, even in the 80s, this became a cult movie, especially at places like Harvard, where they would play it uh, when they'd have final exams and all the students would come into the theater dressed up and basically re uh, recite all the dialogue. And so one of the famous lines is, round up the usual suspects. But at the end of the movie, as you know, Ingrid Bergman has to fly off with her husband. So the movie basically shows sacrifice. And this line, was written about six weeks after the shooting was done by Hal Wallace, the movie's producer. Go ahead. So, World War II. Here we have the movie made by Clint Eastwood, Flags of Our Fathers. Taking a line from my fellow Civil War buffs here by Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain, who made a great speech when she said, in great deeds something abides, which is true about World War II. And as I showed the slide at the beginning, one of the earliest posters that came out after the attack on Pearl Harbor said, remember Pearl Harbor? Well, World War II, never forgotten, always remembered. Thank you very, very much. I'll let the man turn the lights on and I'll take a few questions. Ah. All right, questions. Yes, ma'am. You said that uh, well, in the 30s that there was a lot of moviegoers. They're saying now, and I go every Friday, they're saying now there's more people going to the movies and more money being made than ever before. Like, for instance, this Black Panther is supposed to make a billion. That the, uh, the amount of money they're making is absolutely true. The number of people going is far, far less than people ever went to the movies. They're paying more than No, no. Not even close. Not even close. We have more questions. Yes, sir. You forgot the submarines. 
No, I didn't forget the submarines. We could be here until next year. The destination, Tokyo. Yeah, there, there's a there's a huge number. I mean, they were producing about from 1940 through 1945. I'm talking about A pitchers, not just the B pitchers. You know, there were two classes of pitchers. A pitchers played in downtown Pittsburgh. B pitchers, whatever the local theater was here in Bridgeville, played as part of a double feature. The, uh, they were producing, on the average, about Hollywood, about 150 A pitchers a year. Okay? About 150 a year. So you figure over the five years of World War II, they produce about 750 World War II movies. Since that time, they produced a lot. And as a man mentioned, I mean, there's all kinds of things. There's submarines, there's all kinds of events that are portrayed in the movies. But what I wanted to communicate to you today was how Hollywood portrayed the movies and how it was evolved over time. Any more? Yes, Mr. Fark. You showed the, uh, a uh, poster from the movie Thunderbolt. Yes. Can you explain why they had Jimmy Stewart on there? I mean, Jimmy Stewart flew uh, B-24s and B-17s before he went overseas. Why do you think they had them on? It had nothing to do with Thunderbolts. <laughs> except the thunderbolts were used to protect the bombers. And so, a whole other topic, uh, talk is, um, you know, the actors that went into, Hollywood actors that went into World War II. A large number volunteered. And uh, among those, of course, was Jimmy Stewart, Clark Gable. Clark Gable was, saw combat. They had to take him out of the aircraft because they were afraid he was going to get killed. Tyrone Power, uh, one of the, probably the bravest man that went into, that performed in World War II, was a man who had, had sort of a fair, good, fairly good career prior to World War II, but was much famous post World War II on television. We starred in a television series with Zsa Zsa Gabor, who was the male actor. Do you remember? Eddie Albert. Eddie Albert. Eddie Albert. And I don't know how familiar you are, but Tarawa was a bloodbath. Eddie Albert was a naval officer, small boats, who in the lagoon at Tarawa rescued innumerable Marines under heavy fire, under heavy fire. And so there was a whole, you know, some of the people in World War II were not actors. You know, Lee Marvin, for instance, was wounded in World War II, but he was not famous prior to going in. He was just a guy who was drafted off, off the streets. Yes, ma'am. There's been some debate on what was the top grossing movie of all time. And some people say it was Gone with the Wind if you would show it at today's prices. What is the top grossing movie, do you know? The top grossing movie is, I think, some of the Star Wars movies. The movie that has been seen by more people in the United States in an actual movie theater has Gone with the Wind. Not even close. That's what I say, if you, you know, Gone with the Wind and Robin Hood and those movies that came out in the late 30s, they had huge audiences. And uh, they were playing in a lot of theaters and a lot of people saw them. I mean, of course, high prices were like 75 cents in the big cities at some of the movie palaces, down to 17 cents in some of the local cents. movies. <laughs> so, you know, charging you $8 today, Nine dollars today to see a movie. Yeah. I'll take one more question if you have it. What about the students in the back? No questions? Should I put you all to sleep? They don't have any questions. Yes, sir. I just read where uh, John Wayne, who's supposed to be the real, you know, hero of the war, he and his agents did everything they could for him to avoid going into the war. John Wayne did not serve in the war. Uh, he had a supposed legitimate 4F classification. 
director John Ford, who directed him in many of the movies, and Ford, who was wounded in Midway, um, continued to needle and ride John Wayne because of his lack of military service. And so, you're absolutely right. He did not. Did they do everything? I don't know if they did everything, but they certainly, uh, if he wanted to, could he have gotten in with his 4F? I don't know. Probably. Probably. I kind of remember a lot of uh, the movie actors did not go to the front lines. And uh, the government was very aware that they didn't want, like Joe Lewis never went to the front lines. And uh, Joe DiMaggio never went to the front lines. Stan Musial never went to the front lines. It wasn't because they were cowards, it was because the government didn't want them killed. And so, whatever. Bob Feller did. Yeah, Bob Feller was different. Yeah, Bob Feller served in the Navy for five years, at the height of his career. So did another guy, he Ted did Williams. Uh, so it depended on the individual. Mm -hmm. uh, whether they wanted to go into combat and fight on frontline units or basically uh, abide by what the dictates were of the government, which was to stay behind. For that, again, thank you very, very much, and I appreciate uh, Rosemary and the invitation to come out to talk to you. Thank you.